Welcome to this first edition of the ARRL Eastern Pennsylvania Section's YouTube premiere, What Hams Do. I'm Jay Silber. My ham radio call sign is WA2UAR, and I'm the public information coordinator for the ARRL's Eastern Pennsylvania Section. The ARRL is the national organization for amateur radio. Now, some of you may have heard our podcast series, also called What Hams Do, and in our first program, we focused on young people and why they get into amateur radio. We'd like to expand on that theme, so here's the lineup for tonight's show. Earlier this year, we interviewed an 11-year-old young lady from Northeastern Pennsylvania who had just gotten her technician's amateur radio license. We'll check back with Abby Smith and her mom and dad and see how their amateur radio adventure has progressed. This year's virtual ham fest included a focus on youth and will explore two fabulous presentations by extraordinary young people combining solid science with amateur radio in really fun ways. Spoiler alert, think about balloons. The manager of the ARRL's Eastern Pennsylvania section, George Miller, will join us for a talk about amateur radio and society today and tomorrow. And finally, a special focus on an active amateur radio operator in the Philadelphia area with a great, great story to tell of persistence and perseverance despite what most of us would consider serious adversity. Stay tuned so you don't miss our interview with a guy we call Tango, Tango, Tango. But before we get into all that, let's take a look at the latest news from around the 34 counties in Pennsylvania that make up the ARRL's Eastern PA section. Topping the Eastern PA ARRL news is concern over the FCC's proposed new license fee of $50. The concern many are expressing is that this fee will make amateur radio prohibitively expensive, especially for young people. The FCC is now accepting comments on this proposed rule, and all interested parties are urged to make your opinions known. The link to the comment form is below in this video's description, along with details you'll need to address this specific FCC rule proposal. A lot of hams in the Eastern Pennsylvania section received the special broadcast of images from the International Space Station this past August. These Russian helicopter images came from the Russian module on the ISS. And now a new FM crossband repeater is functional on the space station, allowing hams to transmit to the space station, have that signal repeated and sent down to the ground thousands of miles away, where another ham can reply. Sounds like fun. Now, please welcome our guest news anchor for this edition of What Hams Do, Frances Ponti, KE8HPA. Frankie, as she likes to be called, is a freshman at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. Frankie, what have you got for us tonight? Well, the summer season is ending. It was marked by the most unusual field day in amateur radio history with much of the country unable to participate in the usual camping and outdoor activities because of COVID-19 restrictions. Nonetheless, tens of thousands participated from home, racking up points for their amateur radio clubs. In the eastern part of the country, the 13 Colonies event took place, and here in eastern Pennsylvania, WM3PEN was the extra point station generating this fine QSL card for contest participants. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Frankie. And by the way, I was proud to participate in the 13 Colonies contest on behalf of the Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club here in the city of Philadelphia. In other news, COVID-19 has put a damper on Montgomery County, Pennsylvania's ambitious mesh network. Mesh is a term referring to a group of Wi-Fi routers on tall antennas connecting with each other and allowing each to show everyone on the network of routers what's connected, like other routers, computers, and cameras. Ham radio mesh networks take advantage of microwave frequencies and power settings available only to amateur radio license holders, and they are being built all over the world now as an alternative to landline and wire-based internet connections. So it's a sort of ham radio internet. And its primary use is in the event of a disaster, just 
just like the recent Hurricane Laura in Louisiana, where power, cell towers, and even the internet are lost. Ironically, the final stages of the network's implementation by the Montgomery County Amateur Radio Emergency Service, known as ARES, and the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, or RACES, has been blocked by an emergency, in this case, a pandemic. The Montgomery County Base of Operations in the Emergency Operations Center in Eagleville, Pennsylvania, like most of those in our Eastern Pennsylvania section, is shut down until the pandemic eases. Well, that concludes our look at the news in our section of the ARRL. Now, it was last February that 11-year-old Abby Smith got her technician's license, and at the time, she had big plans for continued growth in amateur radio. Let's check in now with the Smith family from Danville, PA, via Skype. How are you making out in the midst of COVID-19? I mean, Abby, what about school? What's happening with that? Um, I just got my Chromebook a few minutes ago. So I'm going to do online school with that. So we're not going back this year yet. So with you learning with the, with the Chromebook at home, does that make mom and dad teachers now? Yeah. I think we are still teachers, actually. Yeah. Not, not that this is new. It never ends. <laughs> never ends, right? But I mean, you're you're now having to participate or supervise or manage. Yeah, we do. We've always done. Uh, we call it. We used to call it daddy homework. And you know, since she was two, she started reading and math and science, and you know, it just just to encourage them to get into it for their entire lives. Uh, Sharon, you're working through uh, through all of this, right? I have been. Um, I haven't stopped working the whole time. I'm a pharmacy technician at CVS here in Danville, and uh, so I'm considered an essential employee. Um, we've been taking all the precautions we need to to make sure our staff is staying safe and that we can still help our customers. Abby, when we spoke last, uh, back in February, you'd just gotten your technician's license and you were planning on getting your general. How's that going? I am halfway through the questions in the study book. I'm on section 5B, which is the math section, and I finished it today. Tomorrow we're going to move on to the next one. We did that one for like a couple weeks, and I'm learning how to derive numbers when you don't know I or E, and it's pretty fun. It's like a puzzle once you get it, like once you know it, it's pretty cool. So that's algebra. Yeah. That, that puts you, I would guess, ahead of your classmates, right? Mm-hmm. You were going to say, Tom. Uh, don't tell her that it's algebra. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yes, it absolutely is, a, you know, two equations and an unknown. And it is like a puzzle. We made it fun. We're learning the layers of the ionosphere, like the D and E and F1 and F2 layers. I learned those a while ago. You know, we get 2,500 mile jumps and, and we can actually see that on PSK Reporter. It's really fun to look and see how many jumps we're getting. And uh, and we and it gives us a visible tool. And right now the sun's starting to wake up, so we're starting to see China, you know, a little bit. And it's very cool, it, you know, geography and, and sky wave propagation and solar physics, it's all combined, so it's, it makes it interesting. What kind of communications have you been having on the radio, Abby? Um, well, I did participate in field day I do voice and a little bit of FT8, but only on field day because I'm not generally licensed yet. So I do field day, well, I did, under my dad's call sign, and so did my mom. And then I got some contacts, which got our club extra points, so, because I'm under 18. So. Spectacular. That's spectacular. Sharon, you also were studying for a license. Have you gotten one yet? I earned my technician license about six weeks ago, I think it's been. And uh, yeah, that was really something different for me to undergo because I just don't have an electronics background at all. But it was quite an advantage to have not only my husband helping me study, but my daughter as well. They were both pretty much acting as my teachers, my coaches, all that kind of stuff. And I went in very confident and uh, it worked out well. So I'm not going to quite do the general yet. I'm going to let Abby take the spotlight on that for now. And uh, Tom, I believe, not to steal your thunder, but he's studying for his amateur extra. 
So I'm going to let those two take it over. And then again, I will have two tutors when I'm ready to go for my general. All right, just so I can put it on the screen, let me get all your call signs. Sharon, what's your call sign? KC3PMV. So Kilo Charlie 3, Papa Mike Victor. Abby? KC3OTG, Kilo Charlie 3, Oscar Tango Golf. And Tom? Kilo Charlie 3, OLH. So KC3OLH. That's just spectacular. Now, you're, you're all sitting here, obviously, in your scout uniforms. And uh, there's got to be some story behind how this all happened. When did this start with, uh, with scouting for you? Oh, gosh. Um, about, what, 14 years ago? Yep. Our, our son started out in Cub Scouts in uh, second grade. And so we've been in, we were involved with the local pack and then the troop, and he t he's an Eagle Scout. And about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I uh, heard there were girls going to be allowed. So I asked Abby, I said, is this something you would like to do? And she just been to every scout meeting that her brother ever attended ever since she was six months old and never got to participate. So it was a very enthusiastic yes. And so um, we started a new troop and our troop is 4077, which happens to be our geographic coordinates, rounded and truncated. And Danville's a hospital town. So 4077 happened to uh, coincide with you know both things. Uh, and I thought that was kind of a cool idea at two o'clock in the morning. So, uh, and, it, and it's a struggle because starting a new troop is hard. And then right in the middle, you get smacked with a pandemic. So, um, but I think it helps, we, you know, teach kids how to deal with adversity and moving forward and dealing with things. So I think it's very important to keep going. But ham radio is a focus of your troop. Is that right? I was interested in that. I, I was in, into uh, radio in the Air Force. That was my, my job. And I wanted to get back into ham radio. I never got my license. Uh, back then, you had to do the Morse code test and you know school and work. And we found out there was no scouts or no leaders that had a license. Um, there's 800 uh, plus scouts in two counties were combined, Columbia and Montour County. And nobody had a license. No, nobody was into radio. And I thought that was a shame because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great thing for kids to get into. Um, if you think about when we were kids with our walkie talkies and, you know, how much fun it was. So that launched that. So now we have seven uh, scout leaders and scouts with their license. And we're doing an online Zoom session with Cub Scouts right now. We have two Cub Scouts and three parents that are earning their license, their technician's license. So. How many kids in this, in the troop are studying for the licenses or already have them? Um, I believe we have six now, so. Yeah. But in our troop? Oh, in our troop, we just have Abby. We, we have uh, three other girls that we're going to work on here pretty soon. We, I kind of wanted to wait till we could meet in person, but I'm slowly changing my mind and converting it over to, you know, video Zoom sessions. So it's a good format for that anyhow. One of the things that I've been learning as I've been talking to teachers and other people around the country uh, <clears throat> about ham radio and kids is the connection between what they have to study in school and what you can learn when you're studying for your license. Can you think? Can you talk about that? Absolutely. It's a lot of it's a lot of science and math. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of electronics involved, and there's a lot of uh, solar physics and atmospheric science, and you know, you know uh, all of this goes hand in hand with everything that you learn in school. It's all basic math. Um, up to, uh, you know, some advanced math with logarithms and exponents, which they're going to learn pretty soon anyways, but it gives them a practical application. When you learn math in school, a lot of times you don't really see the practical application of that. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's very important to, uh, to get kids exposed to this, and especially at an early age. Yeah. So, um, Abby, when do you expect to have your general license? Um, sometimes by September, what we're hoping for at least. So you and I can get together on an 80 meter conversation at some point. Probably. We were talking uh, last February about antennas you might build if you had scout camp. You're still working on that for next year? Well, what we were going to do at scout camp and now planning for our first 4077 camp outing, hopefully at the Columbia Montour home camp, which is Camp Levine up in Benton. We would set up um, a radio class up there and also, you know, all of our equipment and hopefully communicate with the other scout camp that's close by. Uh, what we would like to do is set up two radio uh, 
setups basically to communicate between those two camps when the kids are there and really gain some interest that way. Tom is already teaching the radio merit badge to several scouts. We've had merit badge college uh, once at one of the local middle schools taught that. And then he's been doing some online as well for that merit badge. And this is going to give the more exposure we give these kids and the more we show them the practical applications, I think that's going to spark their interest. And Abby has uh, successfully sparked the interest of a few of her friends just by their questioning her. What are you doing? That looks cool. Can I try it? And then she'd have to say, well, if you were licensed, maybe you could do what I do. So she's a very good little ambassador for this whole program. Abby, have you have put any thought to the 2021 Scout Jamboree? Um, I don't know if I'm going to be old enough. I don't know if that's a thing. Because you have I to be think, 13 years yeah. old. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're going to miss it by just that much. But um, there is the jamboree on the air, uh, perhaps that we could participate with. So maybe something with that. But our son went to the National Scout Jamboree and uh, had a great time there. So hopefully that's something we'll be looking forward to when she's more um, age appropriate. Well, if they have it in Valley Forge. Uh, the year after when Abby is old enough to go. And you guys come down here, you let me know. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Great. Hopefully we'll drag along a dozen kids with their licenses by then. So <laughs> That would be spectacular. Sharon, Tom, and Abby, thank you so much for participating in our show. You guys are amazing. As for the upcoming Scouting Jamboree on the air that Abby might attend and its associated Jamboree on the Internet, it is scheduled for October 16th through 18th. It's a great opportunity to learn about ham radio and scouting, so don't miss it. There's a link in the description below this video with more information on how to participate. Oh, and just one more accomplishment for Abby. She recently acted as the net control station for the on-air meeting of the Columbia and Montour County Skywarn organization in northeastern Pennsylvania. Skywarn is a volunteer program with nearly 400,000 trained severe weather spotters. Many of these volunteers are amateur radio operators, and they help keep their local communities safe by providing timely and accurate reports of severe weather to the National Weather Service. Every year, amateur radio operators gather from around the world to attend a giant amateur radio convention, or hamvention as it's known, in Dayton, Ohio but not this year. COVID-19 turned that event into a virtual online ham expo. Among the many excellent presentations on all facets of amateur radio was one that caught my attention, Youth in Ham Radio, presented by Staten Island, New York teacher, Carol Perry. Ms. Perry has been teaching a ham radio course in a Staten Island, New York middle school for 34 years. But in amateur radio, she is very well known for her work supporting youth and getting them involved. One of the young people who appeared in Carol Perry's youth forum at the recent online ham expo was 12-year-old Jack McElroy, a seventh grader from Cummins, Georgia. Jack's favorite technology among the many available to amateur radio licensees is high altitude ballooning or HAB. When you build a high altitude balloon, Jack explains, you put a lightweight computer and ham radio transmitter below it that it carries aloft. The transmitter, using ham radio frequencies, sends back tracking data including its GPS position, altitude, speed, and direction. You can get an idea of the size of the computer and transmitter from this image. Yes, that's a computer and transmitter combined. Notice the solar panels that power it. Jack and his sister launched it from a parking lot and it was followed by a drone camera until it got too high and too far away. But because it was transmitting back using a digital format called APRS, they could follow it on a web page designed for just that purpose. They know it went as high as 30,000 feet, but was pushed down to 15,000 feet by an electrical storm many miles away, and that was the last time they heard from it. Thanks to the McElroy family for allowing us to use these images from Jack's excellent presentation during the Youth Forum of Ham Expo. 
Now, our guest co-anchor for What Hams Do, Frankie Monty, also appeared in Carol Perry's youth presentation. And as we mentioned before, Frankie is just starting her freshman year at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Frankie, what's your major going to be? Yes, so right now I'm actually on a track for a double major. I am going to be double majoring in engineering, but also dance. So I'm a dancer as well. <laughs> Sounds like an interesting combination of studies. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, and I actually just got involved with, um, Case Western has an amateur radio club, W8EDU. So we just started meeting this past week, so I'm really looking forward to, to being a part of the club. Oh, so you'll be able to continue your ham radio hobby while you're in school. Yes, yes. You know, Frankie, a lot of people still think of ham radio as an old guy's hobby. With people like you, Abby Smith, and Jack McElroy, that's all changing. Why are people your age getting involved? Well, I think that everybody's ham radio story first starts off with people who really want, um, you know, are very excited to share, and that's one of the things that um, really drew me to the amateur radio community is that there's a lot of people who really want to help young individuals get involved in the amateur radio and they have lots of knowledge and experience that they want to share and their excitement really um, got me excited to you know start this new um, ham radio journey and another thing that I think is really interesting right now about um, young people getting involved in amateur radio is that the ham radio story is a little bit different it's not as much about um, it's, it's still about the, you know, the, the hobby and talking to people on the radio, but I feel like there are a lot of science and mathematics and art concepts that can be applied using um, the amateur radio hobby. So my, my younger brother and I um, followed in, um, and we got our licenses around the same time um, and started getting involved in these projects because of all of the people that really wanted to share their ham radio story to help develop ours. In the Ham Expo Youth Forum, you had a pretty exciting presentation. Tell us about it and how you got into it. Um, so my subject was talking a lot about the Personal Space Weather Station project um, that is being developed by uh, the organization HamSci. And um, as a student, I was able to be a part of that project working to develop um, the ground magnetometer to measure Earth's magnetic field, which makes is a piece of the Personal Space Weather Station. So, Frankie, citizen scientist, amateur radio operator, dancer, and engineering student, congratulations on all your accomplishments, and I hope we see you again as news co-anchor and participant in more episodes of What Hams Do. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thanks, Frankie. Be safe out there. Now, before we move on to our featured guest interview, I'd like to introduce you to the ARRL Eastern Pennsylvania section manager, George Miller, W3GWM. George, what do you think about all these young people getting into our hobby? Well, I think it's great. Uh, the, the, the kids that are getting into ham radio now have uh, some real exciting opportunities. Ham radio is only 100 years old. So uh, basically, we're still in our infancy. We, uh, there's technologies to be explored. There's technologies to be discovered. And the, the kids today are the ones that are going to do it. The, the, the hardest thing that I run into is older people uh, don't seem ready to accept the fact that this is an evolving technology. Just because we did it this way 20 years ago doesn't mean it should be done that way now. And we've got to pay attention to, to these uh, young people that are getting involved and uh, all the uh, different things they're doing with robotics, uh, radio-controlled robotics, and uh, probably a thousand things they're doing that I have never heard about before. Well, George, thanks again for joining us on this program, and we'll catch up with you again in future shows. And now it's time for our special feature. I'd like you to meet a very special guy, Austin Serafin. He has an amateur radio general license, call sign KA3TTT. Austin is totally blind, and in our recent interview, I asked him how he got into amateur radio. Really, one of my first memories is playing with a radio. Um, <laughs> I remember I, I, I was probably around one or so, judging by where we lived, and it must have been a clock radio or something, because I remember there was this thing with buttons and knobs, and I pressed it, and it made this squealing sound, and I was 
intrigued and also worried that I'd get in trouble, but I was really fascinated by it. And, and uh, I remember listening to different things. I remember hearing two muted repeaters then. I remember all kinds of stuff. And I had a shortwave one too. I'm sure these are all Radio Shack things. But back when they sold cool stuff. So you did some shortwave and, uh, listening then? Just tuning around and just hearing all the different sounds. and I just loved it. And uh, we got an Apple IIe. My family got an Apple IIe when I was seven or so. And uh, we got a speech synthesizer for that so it could talk. And I just took to that. As soon as I realized I could make it do whatever I wanted, that was that. All right. So with the screen reader, were you able to write code and then see what you uh, listen to what you had, had written? Let's see. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it reads what's on the screen and what you're typing. So yeah, so how, um, how did that translate into? Well, so then yes, it was all you know part of the whole thing. It was all just technology. I just have always been around technology and radio, and computers and all of it. And then it was, I'm sure, around the same time. I'm sure it was you know seven, eight years old or so. Uh, my parents took uh, my brother and me to the Franklin Institute. Um, my sisters weren't born yet, and. Uh, of course, at the time they had a ham radio room, and I remember going there and just—I was just hooked. It was just—I um, especially I remember turning the VFO, turning the big knob on the radio. I remember that and hearing things, and I especially remember the iambic key. They had uh -huh. an iambic key, and as soon as I touched that, there was just something about it. I was like, "This, this is how you send Morse code." Like, I, there was just something about it, and I just remember being on the ride home and just pleading with my parents, just like, mom, dad, please get me a ham radio. Please, I want a ham radio. Please get me a ham radio. That's what I want. And we should explain. We should explain what an iambic key is for our non-amateur oh, yeah. radio. Listeners. I can show them one if we want to move the... Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Just explain it for now. <laughs> it's, um, it's a way to send Morse code, and uh, it's a, mine has a square base, and it has two paddles, vertical paddles, and uh, one pedal creates dots and one creates dashes. And it's called iambic because if you squeeze them together, it alternates dots and dashes. So with Morse code, um, that, that really got me interested in that. I didn't know code yet. But the, the next kind of thing to happen was that um, my grandfather, my late grandfather, James Talbot, um, flew seaplanes in the Navy in World War II. Oh. And so he knew Morse code. And so he made a chart and my mom put it on, uh, on, you know, poster board on, on thick poster board and put Elmer's glue on it. So she made me a tactile Morse code chart and I put it over my bed. So I would just read, I would feel the Morse code letters and, and, uh, start doing that. And then when I was 10 is when I really started getting serious and realizing, all right, you know, I, I have to study and pass this test. Okay. A novice license oh, yeah. uh, is the very first. For, it was for the very first row, yeah. one. Very first license you can get. And back in the day, it required five words per minute Morse code. Yes. And an elementary knowledge of electronics and the mm -hmm. rules for operating a radio. So I studied for two years. It, I got my license when I was 12. It took me two years of, you know, and I had school going on too, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. this was, I really threw myself into it because uh, I didn't really do much else. You know, I wasn't. Uh, you know, one of the cool kids in school, so that was out. So I had a lot, and I had a lot of time to study. So um, when I was 12, I got my license, and they adapted it for me. I remember two guys came to the house and gave me the test and gave me the Morse code test. And uh, I remember I passed on uh, November 12, 1989. They got my call sign completely at random. I remember my mom opening the license and you know of course when you're waiting and especially when you're a kid you know every day it's like multiple times like did it come yet did it come <laughs> no 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 the mail already came once today um and so finally when it arrived and i remember my mom opening it and they're just being so excited I'm like what's my call sign what's my call um to explain to people um you know just like a commercial radio station has a call sign you know like a, an fm station or something an amateur radio station also has a call sign we got call signs from the fcc so I was like, what's my call sign? What's my call sign? And she opened up and she said, oh, it's uh, KA3TTT. And she said, huh, that's easy. And I said, yeah. KA3TTT, mm -hmm. Kilo yes. Alpha 3, Tango, Tango, Tango. And that's yeah. how you're known in our ham community now as Tango, Tango, Tango. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, when I was a kid, I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it. But now as an adult, I love it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I've just embraced it. So really, you really had to use Morse code a lot more when you were a novice. That was just kind of the way. And uh, I remember when in the beginning, I really wasn't good at Morse code at all. Like, not good. <laughs> and I remember some of the guys in one of the radio clubs were being mean to me and, you know, and that was the wrong thing to do because then I got really good. Uh -huh. <laughs> that made me want to get really good. Um, there's a wonderful organization, and I've since rejoined them uh, as an adult called Handy Ham. And uh, they'd be good to contact as well. H-A-N-D-I-H-A-M. Uh, -H -H yeah, tell me about Handy Ham. And uh, they, they've been around for a while. I, I think they've been around for like 50 years or something. I don't know. But uh, they do... Um, they provide ham radio services and classes for people with disabilities. And in fact, they're about to have their virtual get on the air class, uh, which will run all next week. It'll be fun. Um, and so they, they have a weekly newsletter, which anyone can get for free. And you can join membership dues are quite reasonable. I just became a lifetime member. And, uh, uh, and they do their radio camp. Usually, you know, in most years, they do their yearly radio camp. We can't do that this year, right. of course. Um, because of COVID-19, um, which is why they're doing their virtual radio camp, which is really fun. I'll enjoy dropping in on that. And uh, But as a kid, I thought it'd be really fun. And um, at the time, I remember when I was a kid, they had two radio camps. They had one in California, and they had one in Minnesota. And um, But I didn't pass the technician then. I learned a lot, and I had fun. But, uh, you know, it was real nice out, and it was pretty mellow in California, you know. Right. And... Uh, so then, but it was a fun time. And then I remember going to Minnesota in a, oh, maybe late September or so. Now, Minnesota gets really cold, even then. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I passed my tech and my general in Minnesota. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I had fun for a few years. And, um, but I, sadly, I got out of the hobby. I went off to college. And, you know, it was, it was too bad. I, I shouldn't have gotten out of it. You know, some some guys were a little mean. Some guys were, perhaps their conduct was not as good as it should have been, and uh, knocked a friend and I out of the hobby. And uh, a lot of other people were cool though. But uh, that's how it is, especially when you're a kid. And if you're an adult, you should remember: if you hear a kid on air, one day that kid's gonna grow up and become an adult, <laughs> and remember everything. So then, and a lot of time passed, and uh, a few years ago. I started having to deal with chronic pain. I started getting severe eye pain and headaches. And um, I've been getting uh, really into Qigong and the Chinese medicine and healing myself and all this. And I realized during this whole healing journey I've been going on that I need to get my hobby back because I burned out and I didn't have my hobby. And I realized that and I was like, I lost my hobby. I need to get ham radio back. So for me, getting back into ham radio has been this whole part of my whole healing journey. It's been very therapeutic for me. Getting back into it and hearing the sounds and building my station again from scratch as an adult. It's, it's all been very therapeutic for me. Now, I see you at, uh, at club meetings. We're both members yeah. of the Holmesburg Amateur Radio Club. Absolutely. What, what has that meant for you? It's nice to be a part of a local radio club. Um, it's, um, it's been great to have this weekly social group. It's been really fun. It's really valuable to me to have the Elmer Net and, and you know, Charlie's Nets, uh, right, our weekly right. Nets. It's been really, really neat. Like, you know, like our social gathering, like you were saying, on social media. These are um, meetings that, uh, these are meetings, I should explain, yeah. the Elmer Net. Elmer is a, a ham radio term for mentor. We, uh, we get, and we get together to talk about ham radio issues and other issues on uh, Wednesday yeah. evenings. Um, and, uh, and that's been, I found that to be, uh, personally rewarding because I've gotten to meet some really nice people, including uh, Austin on those, yeah. uh, on those meetings. And we answer questions for each other. We can, you know, if we have issues we're going through, like with our antennas or. And you've had a few. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all have, <laughs> you know, we, we can talk through our issues and keep each other up to date. Yeah. I mean, what we want to do is we want to make people who are not ham radio operators understand the beauty and value of, uh, of the ham community as well as the technology. I mean, we can talk mm -hmm. about 
talking to people all around the world. We can talk about emergency communications. We can talk about uh, computers and amateur radio and software mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and SDR radios. Those are software radios. And we can talk about controlling devices um, on with ham radio frequencies that we're allowed to use. But it is also uh, a, a place to socialize. It is a place to get together. It is a place to meet people uh, mm -hmm. and with common interests. And so um, I think uh, I'm just so glad that I found it. And I'm glad that, uh, that you and I have had the chance to get together. Austin, great to work with you on this project. And thanks for all your help. So that's it for this edition of the video version of What Hams Do. This is Jay Silver, the Public Information Coordinator for the Eastern Pennsylvania section of the ARRL, the National Organization for Amateur Radio, reminding you that this isn't your grandfather's amateur radio. See you all soon, 73, and as we say on the radio, WA2UAR is clear.